Good morning, everybody. I'm Tom Vassell. Welcome to Board Game Breakfast for August 2nd, 2021. Are you hot? Because I'm hot. It's hot everywhere. It, like, was quite... I know everyone's hot all over the place. Here, though, we can go swimming year-round, so there is that. And our air conditioning works, so there is that. School is on the horizon. Everyone is frantically running to back to school sales, and kids are getting ready to go back, and we're gearing up to have traffic from our house to work again. But also, the kids are have something to do. Um, lots of games. I, I am still in people's faces. I was someone said to me the other day, like, oh, there's not many good games coming out this year, and I don't know what year they're living in. Um, there's still a good chunk of the year left with a lot of good games on the horizon, but there have been amazing games. I just play good games right and left. I also play some bad games right and left, but hopefully I do that so you all don't have to. Welcome to Board Game Breakfast, a variety show where we talk about board games, and we always start with a contest, and our contest today, which anyone in the U.S., Canada, or Australia can enter, is to get a copy of The Loop, which, if you just saw, they played last week live, so you can go see how the game plays. This is from Panasaurus Games, and to enter this contest, you just need to email us at contest at dicetower.com. In the subject line, put the word agents as an A-G-E-N-T-S, as it shows right here at the bottom of the screen. And in the body, you need to tell us which convention is Pandasaurus offering pre-order pickups for. So just say what the name of the convention is. For example, if it was Dice Tower Retreat, which it's not, that would be the one that you would put there. And we're going to pick three winners randomly to get a copy of the game. So, hey, there's a lot going on today, but I'm really excited we got an announcement to make, which we're going to do right after these contributors. Hi, everybody. Hello, we are Ryan and Bethany. From Ryan and Bethany Board Game Reviews. All right, today we're talking about Gravwell. This is the second edition. This is just a crazy, chaotic uh, board game where you're just flying on the board forwards and backwards. It's absolutely wild and chaotic. Speaking of crazy and chaotic, um, I was going through a lot of my past work emails just to kind of go through them. And over the past year, I put on quite a bit of weight and I was really frustrated with myself. But then I was going through those emails and I was constantly changing when I could work to try and save time. Daycare was closing. Daycare was opening. Daycare closed again. School is changing. And all of a sudden, I just had so much more compassion for past Bethany because her life was just so chaotic that of course she gained weight like obviously so I just want to encourage all of you if you've gone through a situation like that just have compassion on yourself because I assure you you went through some stuff yeah you're gonna reevaluate you go one again yeah all right so the first edition of this game was a great time I think the second edition kind of added on all good things upgraded components different special ability cards that it added um, more types of cards uh, and it added a six player. I don't know if I said that. Did I say that? It doesn't matter. It adds a six player. Uh, and uh, so basically everything about the first edition is still there and is still fun with all new upgrades as well. It's so funny because you feel like you can control what's going to happen, but you can't. Like you're like, I can plan this. This is what's going to happen. And then bam, it doesn't happen. There's a complete chaos. The ships go everywhere. You're flying forwards. You're flying backwards. It all has to do with whatever objects are closest to you. Yeah. And if they move. Then, then it all changes. <laughs> all bets are off. And it is great. All right, you guys, we had a great time with this one. Uh, it is it is wild. You're not in for a strategy event. This is going to be a chaos event, but that's okay. Yeah, that's fine. Everybody, if you want to hear more from us, you can find us on YouTube or Facebook. We're Ryan and Bethany Board Game Reviews. Everybody, this is Ryan and Bethany. Hoping you have a happy, healthy breakfast. Bye, everybody. Bye, guys. <laughs> Hello everyone, it's Clara and I'm back and today is one of the three hot days in the UK so I am melting right here. But anyway, let's get to it and I'm going to talk about digital versus physical board games. And today is a game I played the digital version but not the physical version and that game is Tainted Grail. So Tainted Grail is kind of, I've put up the uh, BGG link there, but Tainted Grail is, I don't know, it seems like a bit, of, it's a survival game, right? So it's an RPG, but it's all about survival, survival, survival. So um, every decision matters, every decision counts. And, you know, it's pretty easy, it seems, to die. Now that's definitely true in the board game version. So I've talked previously about how I loved Gloomhaven, but then the digital version took took the best of uh, Gloomhaven, but without the setup and takedown time. Uh, I do wonder whether Jaws of the Lion will be uh, my preferred choice, but I've not tried that yet. And so I'd wanted to play Tainted Grail for a long time. I saw a Tom's glowing review and 
the game looks beautiful, but this idea that it's just a slug that you're going to die constantly, I wasn't sure of, and so I thought I'd try the digital version. Now, I am reading in reviews that the digital version is different to the board game, but I feel like the thrust, the main emphasis of the game is still the same, that it's a slug. And whilst on the digital version, if I die, then my reset time is two seconds because I just start a new game. But if you die in the board game, then you've got to reset everything and start again. And it just seems like hard work. It just seems like everything is a battle. I've already said that uh, Seventh Continent, I really struggle with this idea that you spend so long playing and you might not win. And so it just feels like that, but worse for Tainted Grail. But maybe, maybe I'm doing it a disservice. Maybe I should play the physical board game. I'm curious what people think. Until next time, take care. Bye-bye. Hey, everybody. So it is finally time to talk about Dice Tower West. Dice Tower, we run multiple conventions over the course of a year. Well, a normal year. It's been a while since we've run any conventions. Uh, Dice Tower West had to be canceled this year because of the coronavirus. It was the last big convention before, well, the last big U.S.-based convention before last year, before the coronavirus ended. But we have some changes that are coming to Dice Tower West. And who better than to talk about these changes than the director of Dice Tower West, Tim. Let's go to him. Hey, everybody. Tim here from Dice Tower West. I am here today to make our big announcement of our new venue and some more information, just a little bit, because we'll be spreading it out uh, in the months to come, but about Dice Tower West 2022. First of all, it is March 2nd through 6th, Wednesday through Sunday of 2022, five full days of gaming. And our brand new resort, are you ready? Is the Rio Resort and Hotel on Flamingo Road in Las Vegas. That's right, the Rio. This is our brand new venue, and the Rio convention space is spectacular. And just so you know, it's right over the highway from the strip, the hot corner at Flamingo Las Vegas Boulevard, which has Bally's, Caesars, uh, the Bellagio right there. And it's only a 17 minute walk. Tom actually did it, so we know that for sure from the strip and you also ride around there we've got the gold coast you got the palms we got some other restaurants it's it's fantastic you're gonna love the rio here are some great things the room rates 69.99 that's right what that means is weekdays are only 69 dollars, and weekends friday saturday are 99 dollars. but the best part about that is is our resort fee is 22 dollars less than normal resort fee rates. So you got to make sure you book in our block. $69.99 with a $22 less resort fee. Now, the ticket prices are $130 for the five full days of gaming. However, we've added something new. $90 for a three-day badge. That's right. Friday, Saturday, Sunday will only be $90, but I'm sure most of you will be there or want to be there for the full time. So make sure you get our rates. Tickets go on sale Wednesday, September 1st at 12 p.m. Pacific time. That's 3 p.m. Eastern, 12 p.m. Pacific. Tickets go on sale Wednesday, September 1st, so make sure you look out for that. So what can you expect from Dice Tower West 2022? Of course, Tom and the Dice Tower crew will be there. Now, we're going to try to make sure we bring everybody, but again, things change, so you just want to um, lock in anybody except Tom. He'll definitely be there. And of course, you can expect the regular crew and a lot of the contributors as well. So look for them too. And um, we'll have the normal stuff you see, like the, a lot of the events, uh, pitch car and uh, shows, wits and wagers, things like that. You know, the usual. However, we are going to make sure that the number one thing is the library. That's right. We're going to make sure that our library is one of the most comprehensive libraries you'll ever see at a board gaming convention anywhere in the world. It's going to be well curated, lots and lots of games, and all the hottest, latest, greatest games will be there too. It's going to be fantastic. What are some of the other things you can expect? Of course, the friendliness. The Dice Tower conventions, Dice Tower events are the friendliest gaming conventions on earth so a lot of player wanted signs a lot of time to play with tom uh the crew contributors it's going to be fantastic you got to come for that but of course we're going to have our panels we're going to have our exhibitors our demo rooms D, &D werewolf play to wins all those things you expect will be there just as well we are adding three new things too: a historical gaming convention 
to be run by the San Diego Historical Gaming Convention. Uh, they'll be there and sponsored by GMT Games. Demos, tournaments, you'll get to play all the war games and historical games from the right people. It's going to be fantastic. Also, we're adding a prototype convention. What does that mean? Who knows? Yes, we know. <laughs> anyway, we are going to have a thing where you can do play testing. You can get your uh, games uh, seen like a speed dating thing by publishers and stuff. Uh, we'll have a contest. It's just going to be great. Anything you would expect from a normal prototype convention, you can expect here. The third and not last but least, the thing we're adding as well is a content creator convention. That's right. Again, we're putting this together, but what you can expect, this is for content creators. This is going to be people who want to be content creators and anybody who just has an interest in content creation. You're going to come to that. So we've got a lot of things to offer at Dice Tower West 2022, and we're really, really excited at our new venue, the Rio Resort and Hotel, right on Flamingo Road, right near the Las Vegas Strip. So get excited about Dice Tower West 2022, and we'll see you there. Thanks for watching. All right. Well, I am excited too. I just recently went to Vegas to scout out this new location. Folks, you saw that one room there I took a video of. That is one fourth of the size of the spot of the space we have. I'm not kidding. We are not running out of space there. It is huge. There's be and but there's also going to be lots of rooms that you could be cozy in. We have space for a nice exhibitor hall. We're going to have uh, well, we're talking about the library. I'm going to talk about the library a little bit later here in the episode because I just want to, I just like talking about libraries. So well, I'm going to show you a little bit of the Dice Tower West library later on in the episode. But this is coming up later in a month. At the beginning of September, registration will be going live. So come on out, folks. It's going to be fantastic. I don't know about you all, but I am missing these. And I keep thinking about Dice Tower West from last year because, well, that was the last big convention I've been to. And it was amazing. And this, this new location, the Rio, is really good. I like it. It's not on the Strip, but it's close to the Strip. And the, the convention place itself is far away from the casino area. I'm not far away, but like you don't know the casino area exists. So you walk there. It's beautiful. It's gorgeous. Um, it's going to be fun. So consider coming. Consider coming out, whether it's your first time or your whatever number of time, we, we're inviting you to come. All right, let's jump to some contributors. Greetings once again, wonderful humans. Anthony here from Board Game Dads, back to talk to you about another great Zoomable game. Today we're talking about the trivia game Wits and Wagers. Now specifically, I'll be talking about the Family Edition and how you can play this over Zoom. The way Wits and Wagers works is you're going to read a question, and all the questions in this game have answers that are a number of some sort. Everyone's going to write their answer to that question down, secretly and then when everyone's done you can reveal them and put them in order uh, from smallest to biggest then everyone's going to place their meeples on which answers they think are correct you can place your meeples on the same one you can split them up but the big one is going to score you two points if you're correct and the small one one point you'll also get one point if you wrote down the correct answer so why is this a good one for zoom well this is another game that only requires one person to own it yeah, it's great if you both have it, you can you know, go through the cards together and take turns reading questions and whatnot, but you really only need one person to have the base game or the game, and the other people just need something to write on. It could be a dry erase pad, it doesn't have to be, it could be a post-it notes, rip them off, little notebook, whatever. Basically, they would just then, when everyone's ready, reveal their answer, and then the host, so to speak, would want to add those numbers down so that you have all of them at least in one display, and yes, this would require having an overhead camera of some sorts. And bonus, if you do own this game, you can use the dry erase boards and markers for uh, lots of other games in this instance to play over Zoom. So that's pretty cool. All right, folks, that's it for today. Thank you so much, and I'll see you next time. Say happy breakfast. Happy breakfast. This is a very special episode of Grant's Game Rex coming from a fort because I'm recommending fort. Woo, awesome, high kick, cool. Fort is a deck building game, but who cares about the mechanics? The theme is why you're here. Because in Fort, you are trying to build the biggest fort and get the most friends and get pizza and toys. Basically, Fort is everything I've ever wanted out of life. Okay, this is how I wish I could live every single day. I'm a comedian. I don't want to grow up. 
Look at how I'm dressed. And in Fort, I don't have to grow up. In Fort, you will be starting with a deck of 10 cards and a hand of 5 cards. You'll be playing cards out of your hand to recruit pizza and toys into your stuff. You'll also be using cards to add extra resources to your backpack or cards to your lookout or move your fort up into being a better fort. Each card has two sections on it. This top section can be followed by any other player if they burn a card of the same suit and this bottom section is for only you to do. You can recruit new friends from the park or from other players' yards once they have cards there. While the theme is the best part about Fort, it's not the only reason to play this game. There's actually some real strategy, some interesting choices, some depth of gameplay here. And if you're ever feeling burdened by the responsibilities of adulthood, then take a break and play this game, okay? There are no water bills here. And now if you don't mind, please get out of my fort. All right. What's coming from the Dice Tower this week? Well, um, I am going to be ranking all the unlock games in from 1 to 27, or from 27 to 1, actually. So if you've ever been wondered which of the different uh, scenarios are my favorite, I'll be doing that later on this week. We're also reviewing quite a few games. Uh, I'm looking over here. Here's what I'm excited about this week, is I'm taking a look at three uh, good party games, which is amazing to me because the fact of one good party game coming out in a given year is surprising. Here I got three, and two of them are absolutely fantastic, and one is, is good. That's a pretty good spread. Uh, I'll be taking a look at some other games. I don't want to jump into which games I'm doing quite yet because there's a possibility one or two might change, but the big review of the week will come at the very, very end, or at on Sunday anyway, and that will be a four-square review of Ankh. I'm sure some of you are curious what we think about that. We're curious what we think of it. I need to get another play in before I decide uh, what my final ranking will be. It's somewhere between 1 and 10 as a spoiler. So there's lots of things coming out. Uh, of course, podcasts going up on our channel tomorrow, Mandy and Suzanne, um, and you can find that on dicetower.com. We have lots, all our stuff's there. You can see the ratings of our games. You can look at a contributor and see what games that that person has done. You can look at previous top tens that have been done. Hopefully that's useful to you. Let's keep moving. Hello, my name's Jonathan from Board Game Opinions. And in this series of segments, I'm going to be giving you some tips on how to teach a board game. Now, if you're watching this, you're probably pretty interested in board games, but it might be that the friends you play with on a regular basis are not quite as into board games as you are, and you're definitely the one who's expected to teach all the new board games that you keep buying. And it can be tricky. So, without further ado, tip number one is... Read the rules. Now, it might sound obvious. Surely you have to read the rules to be able to teach a game. Well, you'd be surprised how many times people try and get away without it. Maybe they watch a how-to-play video, or they skim through the rules, play with a few components, and think, yeah, I'll be fine. Now, how to play videos can be great. If you're having to listen to someone else's explanation of a board game, and you struggle to follow what they say sometimes, watching how to play video beforehand allows you to jump straight in. You're already familiar with all the concepts, and that's very helpful. But if you're actually teaching it yourself, you really need to know all the rules. So that's not just skim through the rule book, read all the examples, all the little details, because sometimes the devil is in the detail. Uh. I don't think the black market can go next to the tea house. It's a broken combination. Oh, really? Let me check. Who goes first? I think the first player gets an advantage. Maybe they should have fewer coins if they're going first. Oh, I'm not sure who goes first, actually. But maybe they don't get as many coins. Uh, let me check. You don't want to end up in that position, do you? All right, well, hopefully that gets you off to a good footing. Make sure you read the rules. Next time, I'll be giving you another important tip on how to improve your ability to teach a board game. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Uh, I don't think the fountain can go on the edge of the board. 
it needs to be one of the middle tiles so that people can access all the locations. I also want to mention for things that are upcoming this week, I forgot to mention before, was tomorrow I bought the, a box of the Magic the Gathering Dungeons and Dragons set, and we're going to do a draft here, a Dice Tower version of the draft, and then play a couple games and see who, well, we'll see who comes in second, because clearly Roy's going to win, <laughs> yes. but we're going to see who comes in second at least. Alrighty, so let's talk about the Dice Tower West Library. So last year we took the Dice Tower Library and, or, yeah, it was last year, and we shipped it all the way over to Vegas and then shipped it all the way back, breaking shelves in the process and having to restraighten games, some of which is still going on today. Um, yeah, and it was also super expensive. So. The Dice Tower West is now going to have its own library. Now, there are going to be differences between the libraries. So the Dice Tower East library is hand-picked by me. It is hand-painted by other people. Um, not everything's painted in the Dice Tower library. To paint everything would be mind-boggling. But we have a lot of stuff painted in the library. For example, Marvel United, the entire set's painted. And, you know, we're, all different games are getting painted. But... We also upgrade the pieces. I, I work really hard on my organization of it, and so on and so forth. But Dice Tower East does have a limit to how big it's going to be. It's about 2,000 games. It's not going to get much bigger than that. Dice Tower West may not be as refined as Dice Tower East, but it's going to make up for that in size. So before I explain a little bit more about the Dice Tower West library, I walk through it, and I'm going to show you a video of that in a second, but I just before we look at the video, realize it's not sorted out yet. It's not organized in any manner or fashion. It's just basically on shelves so we can see what's in the library. But here it is. All right, so we're taking a look at the library, and this is just me kind of randomly walking through the shelves. Now, you're going to notice here that... If it's a game, it's probably in this library. And that's from amazing games, brand new games, to games that are old timey and just you never even heard of these games. So, I mean, there's Pandemic the Cure, that's kind of new. First Martians, no one plays it anymore. Um, and then there's white boxes full of cards, and you're probably gonna see a shelf of Monopoly somewhere. And there's some Queen games, that's, oh, the Quirkle, that's gonna get played. We also have like every expansion for every game, so we gotta figure out how we're gonna be putting those into the library. So like I said, right now, there's really no rhyme or reason to how these games are on these shelves. But as you can see, there is everything. Do you realize there is like everything for advanced squad leader on these shelves? There's all the time story scenarios. There's small World of Warcraft. See, that's pretty new. That came out this year. And then look, oh, the Monopolies. I saw them. All right. So again, don't worry that this library is going to be mostly old games. But if you are looking for some of these older games, they're going to be there. I could not think of any major game in the last 50 years that was not in this library. I mean, it's probably true, but Tim is also going out of his way to put in every highly rated game on Board Game Geek in this library, come rain or shine. Actually, don't let this stuff get rained on. But if you like war games, you're going to have a great time because I don't know if you just saw that whole shelf of GMT. But in case you didn't, here's some Avalon Hill stuff for you. And if you like these old-timey games they're going to be in the library too. So, oh, there's King's Court. King's Court's a great game. I love King's Court. Um, there's New War Games, the GMT stuff, and you saw some Academy games. Did you see that very old version down there? That round board is an old version of Backgammon. Um, so, there's the deputy game, and but then there's Roads and Boats underneath it. Basket. Basket's a great game. Now, you might notice and say, wow, how many games are in this library? I think there's about 6,000 right now, folks, and it's constantly growing. Um, there is 60 shelves, I believe, full of games. And as you can see, they're quite packed. Now, they're in no sort of order right now. That will, We'll be working on getting them in order and getting them cataloged and stuff. This is as of two weeks ago, and someone's going to be working hard on this as a full-time thing to put these games in place. But if you go to this library and say, I can't find a game, 
The only excuse I'm going to take for that is, is that you literally just can't find the game you're looking for because the shelves are so many shelves. But you can't find any game to play. Oh, did you guys see Broadsides? Man, that game was... That's an old, cool game. Oh, there's Forbidden Stars. I saw that. Cormier and Orleans. So again, while some of the shelves are just full of old, old, old games... Wait, did I see some empty shelves? We're going to have to fill those. Look at this. I'm just walking around. I'm, I'm, And this was like my fifth pass to this library. I went through this library and looked at everything. So you can see there's four very long rows. Over there are some boxes with stuff in it. But wait. Four more shelves of, uh, over here? I know these shelves are here because I actually sent these games to Dice Tower West to put in the library. Look at that. Equinox. That's new, new game, and it's in the library. So... Anytime we get the um, extra games here, cool games, we send them off to Dice Tower West. Oh, I'm back on. Oh, wait. I don't wear the hat for this. All right. So, Dice Tower West Library is going to be in two different sections. We're going to have an actual library. You go in, grab the game, check it out, go play it. But then we're going to have another big library called the No Checkout Library. And this library is going to have all those old games in it and valuable games like that. And it's going to be in a separate room, and you just go in that room, just grab a game off the shelf and play it. But the games will never leave that room otherwise. They're just there for you to grab off the shelf. You're like, ooh, I like to play Careers. I like, oh, here's a game from my childhood. I'm going to go in there and look at all these old games and play a couple of them. And I think it's a neat thing, because this is almost at no convention, unless it's there um, unironically, you know, oh, we never change the games in our shelves. But we want to have both. We want to have the hot new games, and there will be a hot games area, personally curated by myself, uh, with hot games that are set up on tables so you can play those. And then there will be a full-fledged library. And part of that library is going to be run by the new war game department that, uh, that, that Tim was talking about. So the, the war games. But then all that old stuff is going to be in that no-checkout library. And I think you're going to really enjoy that, having those two things. Just not nostalgia, but also some of those older games are good and fun to play. So hopefully that's going to be exciting for you. I hope you're excited seeing all those games. But that's what the Dice Tower West Library is. Let's keep going. Hey there, everyone. It's Jen, the board game librarian, flipping some pages and pushing some cubes with my segment from the page to the table where I pair books and board games together. And I dig books. <laughs> Ah, this week I am featuring The Secret Life of Bees by Sue Monk Kidd, 20 years old at this point, had never read it until recently. Here we have 14-year-old Lily Owens in South Carolina in the 1960s, and uh, she ends up leaving home with... Um, uh, someone who works in her house and ends up fleeing to a an apiary, a, a bee... A, a, beekeeping place uh, where she encounters three sisters who change her life and really teach her what it's like to be a woman to have a mother in her life and they teach her all of their secrets about beekeeping so while reading this book i was of course thinking of honey buzz elf creek games uh one to four players um one of the most unique games I think we have played this year, if we had done a 2020 list after we had played this game, it would have been in maybe our top three games. In this game, you are sending your worker bees out to do a variety of things, to get um, nectar, to build your hive, to get more workers, um, to fill orders. Really unique game. Love this one so much. The production that Elfkrieg did on it is outstanding. I think it's coming back in print or there's going to be another run of it. Uh, so if you get a chance to um, order it, I highly recommend Honey Buzz. Happy breakfast, everyone. All right. Well, Later this year, in November, on Amazon Prime, they're going to come out with a Wheel of Time video, I mean, TV series. Um, and so I thought, huh, it's been a long time since I've read the Wheel of Time. I mean, the last time I read it was when the final book came out. I reread the series at that point. So I started rereading the series. I'm currently in the middle of book two. But I thought I would review the first book, uh, Wheel of Time. Uh, 
The Eye of the World. Yeah, I forgot the name of the book briefly. By Robert Jordan. Now, The Wheel of Time is a long book series. There are 13 books in the series. Uh, or is there 14 books? There's a lot of books in the series. Um, this is the first book. And if you're going to watch this TV series and you want to read the source material, I doubt they're going to go farther than the first book in season one. They might, but I doubt it. In, this is a world, and this is, if I'm ranking all the books in this series, this is in the top five, the first one. And it's an okay book to read and then stop reading the series if you want to. Um, it does leave, a, there's definitely like more stuff is happening. You're going to see more cool things. I mean, but it does have a conclusion to this particular chapter of the story, but not even close to concluding the entire story as a whole. In this world, there's a magic system of sorts, which is closer to almost the force than it is to magic, but it's, it's magic, but only women can use the magic. Uh, if men try to use the magic, they go crazy, except there's supposed to be one man, the dragon reborn, who can use this, and that's the, the gist of the story. And in this story, there's a bunch of kids, young adults, in a village that are all friends, and events come and swirl them out of this little village on the edge of nowhere out into the bigger wide world and the story goes from there and all the characters there are five of these young people in this and those five become the five main characters of the story although there are many other main characters um and, that, and that's the thing so wheel as a time wheel of time as a whole um is a overwrought story i i, I do not envy the people making a TV show because they're going to have to be cutting characters right and left. In this first book alone, there's well over 100 characters, I'm sure, and there's there's at least 1,000 by the time the story ends. Now, some of these characters come and go for sure, but I have a hard time keeping track of everybody and everything. This one is not so bad. It is essentially a journey, as most fantasy stories are, like we start from point A and we go to here. And there's side tracks and side quests, and the party gets split, comes back together. That sort of thing happens. But the characters are really good. Some of the problems in Wheel of Time are it's just bloated, the whole series as a whole. That happily doesn't really start till around book seven. Book seven, eight, nine are just bloated and probably could have been condensed into one book, in my opinion. You can see a little bit of the beginnings of that, but not much. There's also in my opinion, over the wheel of time. There's a lot of men versus women just nonsense all the time. The women are constantly like, men are so stupid. And the men are always like, I don't understand women. There's definitely a lot of that in book one. It gets more pronounced and annoying, in my opinion, as this series goes on. But here it's just more of a sideline type thing. And, and there's very few of the characters in this series ever know how to communicate. I would not like most of them except for Perrin, I think. But for most of them, they just simply can't ever speak straight out. At the beginning, the Asadai, which are the women who can use this, uh, this magic power, and I'm not using all the different terms here because I'm going to mispronounce all of them and get yelled at it. I probably mispronounced how I said their name. Um, but anyway, these, these people are known for being kind of coy in how they talk. But they talk that way to each other. And everyone else talks in a non-straight way. And sometimes people say, I know something. And then right before they say it, something happens. And that happens all the time. But there's really cool lore. There's really cool, neat stuff in the background. And it is a good story. It's a rollicking tale. And this first book, it just, it's action-packed. There's a moment in the middle where two of the characters are running away from bad guys. That seems interminable. It's like... All right, I, I, I keep reading this. Are you guys going to ever get to where you're going? They're like making a trip, and the book's like, we want you to feel that trip. But other than that, the story moves at a really good pace. There's a lot of cool characters. The most annoying characters in the series haven't shown up yet or just briefly show up in this one. <laughs> one of the most annoying characters in the series is in this, but she's not as annoying at the beginning here. And some of the main characters, Moraine, Lan, Perrin, Really cool characters that are fun and interesting and they do some neat things. And you're like, wow, I'd like to know more about the backstory. I, th I don't think it's required. I don't know what this TV series is going to be like, you know, how much they're going to condense things. Um, but if you are interested in reading it, read the first book and then decide if you want to go farther. Books, I mean, if, if you're going to read through the series and you just want... 
Books one, two, and three are all really good. Book four is actually my favorite book in the entire series, but it kind of starts a new chapter. And then book five is okay. Book six is fantastic. And then, like I said, seven, eight, nine, it really drags down. Robert Jordan finally started moving on book 10, then unfortunately he passed away, and Brandon Sanderson took his last book and split it into three books with a grandiose, cool finale, but whew, it was a bit getting there. So anyhow, that's what I think of the Wheel of Time. I have the world. Let's keep moving. Hi, everybody. I'm Doug Jr. And I'm Doug III. And you're watching a Fellowship of Meeples with Doug and Doug Jamie. Well, once again, we're going to be talking about a game in our collection that is great for game night. However, we're going to pick one at random, starting with a letter found in this deck from the game Trophies. So, Doug the Third, why don't you pick a card at random? Mm. Well, that, let's see what letter we are discussing we today. T! Yay! Let's find a game that starts with T. Okay! Well, I think you might be surprised what we came up with, because we pass through things like terraforming Mars, uh, Tides of Iron, uh, Tattoo Tidal stories. Blades, Tattoo Story is a party game we play sometimes. And we actually picked this one, Zero. It doesn't even sound like a T name, does it? But it's no. Zero. And the reason that we picked this one is this is a great game it for is. a gaming night. It's so well-rounded for a large group of experienced or new gamers just to hop in and get going. It plays up to eight people, so you can include you know, a large group in this game. And there's hardly any rules to explain. It's, it's very it's simple. It's extremely simple. You just place one of your tiles on the board. You have to follow the path to the end. And if your player goes off the board or runs into another player, you are eliminated. Yeah, the last person standing wins. That's it. So a great game for game night, especially if you have about eight players that all want to play the same thing. Zero. If you haven't played this one, check it out. Mm -hmm. Hey, thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time on A Fellowship of Meeples. Have a great breakfast. That's it for another board game breakfast, folks. Don't forget, we'll be talking more about Dice Tower West as we get closer to September. Also, I should mention, we're going to be at Gen Con. We're doing a live show at Gen Con. It's probably going to be a live top 10 list. Go sign up for that show if you want to come. There's only so many tickets, and we would love to see you there. Uh, so that's coming up in the future. In about 20 minutes, Z's going to be doing what's happening, so he'll see you there. And then I'll be back for Q&A at noon. Thanks for... Thanks for watching. <laughs> Board Game Breakfast on the Dice Tower. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell. See you next time. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production.